In my last lecture, I focused on identity and protest art within the United States. Remember that Puerto Rico is part of the United States, albeit not a fully integrated part. And now we move into the wider world. We talked about a book from the sky briefly at the end of our mop-up unit on Asian art, just before Christmas break, so a lifetime ago, right? Let's recap. What political context do these works have in common? They're both about the Cultural Revolution, right? The lithograph on the right is pure propaganda art, designed to inspire the faithful to support Chairman Mao's efforts to instill revolutionary purity by force, if necessary, even though the poster itself is very unthreatening. A Book from the Sky is widely interpreted as a protest against the Cultural Revolution, although it carries deeper and more complex and confusing messages. I found a very interesting video on Zhu Bang and his work from the Bloomberg Brilliant Ideas series. I'm going to let this excerpt serve as my main lecture on this work. This work is a commentary on language and its manipulation, on mass production and commercialism, and on government propaganda from Mao's Little Red Book on. And maybe it's also a frustrated rebel's commentary on our inability to communicate, or at least to communicate truth. But one of the reasons I like this artist is that he didn't really give up on language or on communication. One of his projects during his 18-year stay in New York was English calligraphy. Can you read this banner? Designed by Zhu Bing and hanging outside the Met, it says, art for the people in English characters masquerading as Chinese characters. Here's another installation artwork by a Chinese artist and another example of social and political commentary. There are really two remarkable facts that you need to remember about these sunflower seeds. One I gave away in the label of the previous slide. The seeds are made of porcelain. Just as remarkably, each seed is hand-painted and individual. They may look alike, but like sunflower seeds in nature, each is subtly different and individual. Let's watch a couple of brief clips from a video that the Tate Gallery produced about this work. You will hear from the artist himself. Now that you've watched the video, what points do you think the artist is trying to make with this work? Here's what the Tate website has to say. Sunflower Seeds invites us to look more closely at the Made in China phenomenon and the geopolitics of cultural and economic exchange today. The commentary continues. The precious nature of the material, the effort of production, and the narrative and personal content create a powerful commentary on the human condition. What does it mean to be an individual in today's society? Are we insignificant or powerless unless we act together? What do our increasing desires, materialism, and number mean for society, the environment, and the future? By the way, the Tate stopped allowing people to walk on the seeds when the museum discovered that this was spewing potentially hazardous ceramic dust into the air. And yes, this work is about the Cultural Revolution as well. Propaganda images from the time often depicted Chairman Mao as the sun and the mass of people as sunflowers turning toward him. Yet, and I'm quoting the Tate website again, Ai Weiwei remembers the sharing of sunflower seeds as a gesture of human compassion, providing a space for pleasure, friendship, and kindness during a time of extreme poverty, repression, famine, and uncertainty. So, sunflower seeds represent propaganda, poverty, community, and friendship, all at the same time. It makes it a potent symbol indeed. If you have time, take a minute to talk about how the political message of these works are similar and different. Well, I don't know what you just said, but it seems to me that both works represent a commentary on propaganda and the manipulation of symbols and language during the Cultural Revolution. Both showcase traditional Chinese arts, woodblock prints on the one hand, porcelain on the other, and at least indirectly, therefore, they criticize the culture of mass production. Both offer employment for people with traditional skills, such as carving woodblock and creating and painting por porcelain. But Zhu Bing's work is deliberately mysterious, even uncommunicative. It holds a lot of words, but no other clear meaning. 
even if the Chinese Communist authorities were convinced that the books of this, the book from the sky contained some kind of subversive secret code. Sunflower seeds, by contrast, carry multiple meanings for the viewers, especially the Chinese viewer, yet these meanings are much less disguised and maybe more optimistic as well. I should note one further similarity. Both artists suffer from political upheaval in their youth. Zhu Bing was exiled to the countryside during the Cultural Revolution. Ai Weiwei, as a child, was exiled with his father, a well-known poet, to a labor camp in the Gobi Desert. Both artists later got into trouble with the Chinese Communist authorities. After the 1989 Tiananmen Square revolt, you've seen the photo at the bottom right before, the Chinese authorities turned against new wave artists like Zhu Bing, and in 1990, he left for America. He returned in 2008 to a prominent government art post. Like Zhu Bing, Ai Weiwei also spent a number of years in New York, but decided to return to China. Ai Weiwei was arrested in 2011 and placed in detention for 81 days. The authorities also confiscated his passport, which meant he could not travel outside of China. They returned the passport to him in the summer of 2015, as this photo indicates. He has since lived in Europe and remained very active in promoting human rights around the world. We talked about this work before, back in Unit 1, again, a very long time ago. This short museum video clip should serve as a refresher, and I predict you'll enjoy the performance art. So in terms of content, what does our corned beef can bull have in common with the sunflower seeds? I think they're both commentaries on the loss of indigenous or national traditions in the face of economic globalization. By the way, both works might also fit into a loose category known as conceptual art, a term I encounter a lot and some of you encountered in an extra credit reading, but haven't really talked about. The Tate defines conceptual art as art for which the idea or concept behind the work is more important than the finished art object itself. Remember the fountain? The video in your reading point out that canned corned beef has replaced local foods within the Pacific Island diet and is commonly given as a gift at weddings, funerals, feasts, and other special occasions. The canned meat is high in fat and cholesterol, contributing to a huge obesity and diabetes problem in the islands. The introduction of cattle, likewise, has changed and many people argue degraded the sensitive ecosystem of the Pacific Islands. Cattle use a great deal of water, they pollute rivers and produce methane gas, and land is being deforested to produce pasture land. So why does the term 2000 appear in a work that was produced in 1994? I didn't have a clue, so I did some research. One scholarly article reported, and I quote, the 2000 in the title suggests millennial fantasies and brings to mind stereotypic cargo cult practices. Anyone know what a cargo cult is? When Pacific Islanders who had only Stone Age technology encountered their first Americans and Europeans and saw the huge array of goods that these Westerners brought with them, a few started worshipping these goods or the people who produced them. Some of these so-called cargo cults believed that spirits would bring them similar goods at some point in the future. That's the millenarian aspect. Sometimes members of these cults would use local materials to construct fetishes of Western goods. Here are some cargo cult photos. As you might guess, many of the first contacts were made during the Pacific campaigns of World War II, so you see airplanes. Here again, we see the ambiguity in Tuffery's message. Are outsiders inflicting health, economic, and ecological catastrophe on Pacific Islanders, or by purchasing and valuing Pisopo, are Pacific Islanders bringing catastrophe on themselves? Yeah, I realize I'm including a lot of videos, but in this last unit, we have a really exciting opportunity to hear from the artists themselves. Wonderful as it is to hear, say, Simon Shama talking about Rembrandt. Imagine being able to hear Rembrandt talk about Rembrandt. So hang in there, okay, and watch this excerpt from the artist TED Talk. It will give you an opportunity to see many other works in this series. So, now that you've seen the video, what is the content of this artwork? What is this work about? I figured I should know what the words on the face said, so I looked them up and included them in your reading. Once you know something about the poet and what the poem said, you look at the word at the work differently. The artist considers herself an opponent of the current political regime in Iran. She's an exile. Some of her works, particularly in her films, are more clearly hostile to the Islamic government. 
So, why all these guns? Is she criticizing women for embracing violence? Or is she admiring their strength and determination? Maybe both. Here's another work from the same series with a poem by the same author. So how do you interpret the titles of these works? Are women silenced by the Islamic Revolution or empowered? Maybe both, just as the veil both protects women from the male gaze and hides away their individuality. This deliberate ambiguity has brought a lot of criticism down on the artist. The Iranian leadership views her work as dangerous and subversive, but outsiders are often uncomfortable with what seems to be an admiration for violence. So what do you think? Here, just to complicate the debate, is another work from the same series with a poem by a different author, this time a modernist feminist, now deceased, whose writings have been strongly condemned by the Islamic regime. And maybe this too is the silenced voice of women. This was one of your summer works. Sure seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? It's also the last work for today. Hurrah! And maybe I'm getting a little punchy because what really struck me when I started doing more research into this work is that much of the commentary in the press isn't about its meaning, it's about the efforts to guess how this work could actually have been made. Specifically, how in the world did the Tate Gallery install a huge crack down the center of a gallery floor? Here is the official Tate Gallery statement reported in a British newspaper. The artist and Tate are not going into great detail other than to say we opened up the turbine hall floor in order to create a cavity, a spokeswoman says. The work has been made with utmost precision according to drawings by the artist and nothing was accidental. Well, that set the press into a frenzy of investigative journalism, and I read several articles where builders were interviewed about possible techniques. I have a link to one of them below. Mr. E is a builder who was working at the Tate Modern on another project while Shibboleth was being installed. And although for contractual reasons he does not wish to be further identified, he is very happy to recount what he witnessed. And this is what he said, quote, They dug a dirty great trench about a yard wide and a yard deep, says Mr. E, still lost in wonderment. Then they brought in a lorry load after lorry load of cement and poured it in using 10-foot sections of what looked like carved polystyrene molding to form the sides. Then a whole bunch of people lay down on their stomachs for about a week and finished it off with brushes. Looked bloody uncomfortable, I can tell you. It's about racism. I can't see it myself, but I'm not much of a one for modern art. It was a pretty good trench, though, and one hell of a lot of cement. Good luck to them. I love that. So what does it mean? Okay, here again from the Tate website. Salcedo is addressing a long legacy of racism and colonialism that underlies the modern world. A shibboleth is a custom phrase or use of language that acts as a test of belonging to a particular social group or class. By definition, it is used to exclude those deemed unsuitable to join the group. You guys can do better than that, right? Where does that word come from? To continue the commentary, the history of racism, Salcedo writes, runs parallel to the history of modernity and is its untold dark side. For hundreds of years, Western ideas of progress and prosperity have been underpinned by colonial exploitation and the withdrawal of basic rights from others. Our own time remains defined by the existence of a huge socially excluded underclass in Western as well as post-colonial societies. In breaking open the floor of a museum, Salcedo is exposing a fracture in modernity itself. And here's what the artist told the BBC. Shibboleth represents the borders, the experience of immigrants, the experience of segregation, the experience of racial hatred. It is the experience of a third world person coming into the heart of Europe. Doris Salcedo was born in Colombia and continues to live and work in Bogota. At last, a global artist who hasn't moved to London or New York, although she did earn a Master's of Fine Arts at NYU. Her art is deeply influenced by Colombia's troubled past, which includes not only the legacy of colonialism, but also dictatorship, drug wars, and an ongoing civil war. So here, let's hear briefly from the artist. What you see on this slide is perhaps the most famous of her installations. On the 6th and 7th of November, 1985, members of the M19 guerrilla group took over the Palace of Justice in Bogota and held the Supreme Court hostage. The siege lasted 53 hours and 12 of the 25 Supreme Court justices died in the attack. 
17 years later, Salcedo lowered wooden chairs against the facade of the new Palace of Justice. The installation took over 53 hours, the length of the siege, and Salcedo described it as an act of memory. Not only not a required work, but I find it actually maybe more interesting. Next up in our headlong dash through global contemporary art is feminine.